Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and I'm here today at the Morphe Auction Company taking a look at the very last gun manufactured by Dr. Samuel McLean, the man whose ideas would ultimately become the Lewis gun. Now this is unusual in that this gun actually dates from after World War I. This is from about 1919. Uh, if we go back to the beginning of the story, Dr. McLean, Samuel McLean, was born in Iowa City, Iowa in 1857. Uh, paid his own way through university and uh, got himself educated as a medical doctor, was quite successful in that role. He was popular, he was well liked, but he also had kind of an inventive mind and he started coming up with a bunch of ideas. In fact, by the time he passed away in 1930, he would have some 36 US patents to his name, many of them revolving around firearms design. And he was interested in a lot of different aspects of firearms design, the most notable areas that he got into were uh, recoil reducing things, basically muzzle brakes, complex and interesting muzzle brakes, uh, automatic cannons, and machine guns. Now he really put this into practice in 1896 when he formed the McLean Arms Company, and this got serious pretty quickly. In 1897, he turned over his whole medical practice to his assistant to run so that he could focus full-time on firearms development. And he had a good thing going. His ideas were, they looked like they had a lot of promise. Uh, the McLean Arms Company interested a number of high profile sorts of investors. He had uh, General Joseph Wheeler um, of the CSA, later of the US military, uh, was an investor. Marcellus Hartley, who's one of the principals at Remington, was an investor in the McLean Arms Company. Like, he had legitimate ideas here, and he was attracting interest from legitimate people who knew all about the small arms industry. Now, the problem was, McLean was never quite able to get the gun working well enough to be militarily successful. And he would go through a number of trials of both his semi-automatic cannons, uh, mostly a 37 millimeter, a one pounder, but also uh, did some work on a three pounder, which would probably have been a 57 millimeter gun. Bunch of trials never really paid off. He had a water-cooled machine gun. In fact, he actually started with a bolt-action uh, clip-feed rifle. That didn't go anywhere. He ultimately developed this into a machine gun, or redeveloped a machine gun, because that was the thing that interested militaries at the time. Um, it was a big, very, very cool, unusual-looking, steampunky sort of uh, water-cooled machine gun, which is notable, I will point out, for the fact that unlike virtually all other water-cooled guns, this one was actually designed to recirculate steam and water where most guns like the Maxims um, and related water-cooled guns will have a condensing can. And so as the gun fires, water heats up, turns into steam, and it's then pulled off by hose and dropped into a condensing can into some existing liquid water to recondense it. And eventually the water jacket runs empty, the condensing can is full, and then you pour the can back into the water jacket. McLean's gun actually did this whole recirculating system by itself. And that was probably part of the reason that it wasn't successful. It had a pressurized system, so you'll notice it looks kind of like it's got a scuba tank on it. It has valves, it has condensing coils, it has all sorts of extra stuff that it probably shouldn't actually have. He probably shouldn't have tried in incorporating all that stuff. Now, I'm getting a little sidetracked here. Um, ultimately, the McLean machine guns would fail in a series of military tests, and in 1910, the McLean Arms Company, by then actually in its second iteration, failed and went bankrupt. If you want a little more backstory on this and how it actually evolved into the Lewis gun, I would recommend checking out the CN Arsenal video on the Lewis gun. He covers this development and how this turned into the Lewis. Um, Ultimately, the investors, when the company went broke, brought in Isaac Newton Lewis to give them some comment on the viability of the patents and the models that they had left. Lewis figured air cooling is the way of the future. He got some ideas about air cooling. The investors then brought him in and the Lewis gun was the result. But that isn't quite where this thing comes from. This was uh, McLean's last attempt at a military firearm. So, in 1910, after his company went bankrupt, McLean ended up moving, uh, he moved up to Detroit and went to work in the automobile industry. And he was reasonably successful in there. Never stopped inventing, however. And by the time World War I ended, he, he had one last idea for an air-cooled machine gun. Shoulder fired, kind of more like a, sort of analogous to the BAR. This was select fire, so you have a semi-auto trigger and a full auto trigger in it. Um, and he presented this to the Navy for testing in 1919. So 
let's take a look at what this thing actually does, and then we'll talk about what happened to it in 1919. Looking at this up close, we have a shoulder stock. The thing is clearly designed to be fireable from the shoulder, although in uh, Navy testing it was actually fired from a tripod mount. Uh, two triggers. The front one is the full auto trigger, and the rear one is the semi-auto trigger. This hook here is the magazine release. You can see it retracts a little plunger there at the bottom. And this brings up an interesting element, which is what is the magazine to this thing? Well, um, I have a couple original pictures. These were printed in uh, the book The Belgian Rattlesnake about the Lewis gun uh, by William Easterly. They show the original magazine, uh, although it is not present on this gun, unfortunately. It is missing somewhere. But somewhere out there is a McLean 1919 automatic musket uh, magazine. What we do know for sure is that there is a, a mechanical ratcheting system here to rotate the drum. It is a drum style magazine and it's sort of a, a donut shaped magazine. Uh, probably the closest thing I can come up with would be an Ackles drum from a Gatling gun. Now whether it mounts off on the side or over the whole main body of the gun is not entirely clear. Easterly's book says it mounts on the side. This is very much centered on the gun. Um, the front grip here is the exact same height as the magazine catch, which makes me wonder if the magazine is supposed to slide over the whole gun. Like I said, it's really not entirely clear. What I can tell you is that it feeds here through the top and it ejects down here out the bottom of the receiver. Looking at this up close, unfortunately the receiver, the rear of the receiver here has been cut away. That is because this was in fact a machine gun, but it was not registered as such. And at some point, someone cut this away so that it was considered legally destroyed and not illegal to possess. Um, unfortunate, legally necessary. Now, this side of the gun would originally have had a couple wooden cover plates like you have over here. They are missing and there would have been a hole in them down here to take, to let out empty casings. So uh, you probably noticed we have this handle over here. This is non-reciprocating. It's currently locked down in the stowage position. You can pop it up and out to actually use. That's why there is this cutaway in the back of the stock because the handle comes back and out like that. When we open this up, first off, that's your ejection port right there. We have an interesting style of locking system here. You've probably seen uh, interrupted thread style of locking lugs where you try to get the most surface area possible of locking surface. Uh, McLean definitely went for that. Pull this all the way back. There you go. At least a dozen locking lugs in there. And you can see just barely up into the receiver here, you can see the mating surfaces where those all lock into place. So you've got lugs on this side and you've got lugs on the opposite side of the bolt. Um, and it is a rotating bolt, uh, very much a Lewis style rotating bolt, which of course is ultimately, in fact, a McLean style of rotating bolt. So what we have here is an operating rod down here that has the firing pin on it. You can see the firing pin right up in there and it's running through a cam track in the bolt. So when the operating rod goes all the way forward, like that, it has now forced the bolt to rotate into the locked position and the op rod which holds the firing pin is slightly rearward. It's about an inch farther back than it would be when fired. So when I drop the firing pin, what will happen is there is a sear that's holding this op rod back, it will drop, the op rod goes forward, the firing pin goes forward and that fires the gun. This is precisely the same system that was used in the Lewis gun. Just Isaac Lewis massively simplified it compared to this uh, with just two big locking lugs at the front instead of this system. Uh, McLean's earlier designs also had multiple lugs. Um, his water-cooled machine gun I believe had five sets of dual lugs on each side, so like 20 lugs total. Um, the idea is not bad, but you don't really need that. Uh, you're just as well having a couple that are a lot smaller or a lot larger. 
Now if we look at the bolt face a little more closely, we'll see a couple of interesting things. This acts as the ejector and it also picks up a cartridge from the magazine to feed. So you'll notice when this comes all the way back, that ejector gets pushed down under that rear lip of the receiver. When it does that, it is pushing the cartridge. This is a little hard to see, but if you look at the bolt face there, you can see that that ejector gets pushed down. Boom, right there. And it's going to push the cartridge straight out this ejection port right here. There are two extractors, one on each side. So the cartridge is held firmly this way and pushed laterally bloop, out the bottom of the gun. By the way, the bolt handle also has this nice uh, stowage position. So it's, there's a little tiny spring in, in the front and you can push it, the bolt handle forward, rotate it down so it stows up nicely against the body of the gun, possibly keeping it from interfering with the magazine. That's not entirely clear to me, as I said, um, but then you lift up to actually make use of it. Now, looking at this thing, you'll notice it has, obviously we have a barrel up top and the barrel's knurled to give it, in theory, maybe a little more cooling capacity. And we have this big thing at the bottom, which seems a little out of place. Like, why is that so large? It's obviously too large to be a gas piston, right? Well, no, actually this is kind of modeled on the McLean semi-auto cannons, which have this very large gas piston in them. I can actually take the front cap here and unthread it, take that off. And then lo and behold, that is the gas piston face. When I pull the bolt back, you can see that whole thing reciprocating. Um, right up here at the top is the gas port into the barrel. This thing is just a really ginormous gas piston. Unfortunately, I can't take the piston assembly apart. Uh, but there is a recoil spring wrapped around it inside here, just like all of the earlier McLean guns. The one bit of disassembly that I can do for you is to take the lower off. We have a bolt here that just connects the upper and lower assemblies. Okay. There in stowage, take that bolt out. And then we can take off the lower. That makes it very easy to see the sear here. And that sear holds on to the back of the op rod, which is this hook right here. So, so that's your operating rod. And that is going to rotate the bolt to lock and unlock. You can see the cam track here at the end. So that's unlocked. That's locked. So I believe this one was the full auto that pulls down both levers. The rear trigger here is semi-auto, although to be fair, I'm not entirely sure where the disconnector is. It might just be not working anymore in this gun. Uh, you can see the little lug on the front of the charging handle. That's what actually pulls back on this lug of the, uh, the operating rod. Actually, it's on this side. It's right there, that little hook. And you can see the large diameter mainspring just barely down inside there. Obviously, McLean never did become wealthy off of his patents, despite the success of the Lewis gun. Um, he did actually file a lawsuit uh, after World War I in an attempt to get some some financial compensation uh, from the company that had used what were originally his ideas and patents. That went all the way up to the Supreme Court um, before it was ultimately ruled uh, against him. Um, remarkably, I mean, Samuel, Samuel McLean was apparently a very friendly, outgoing, nice guy. And despite all of these setbacks, he never did actually blame uh, Isaac Lewis for the, the turn of events. And as far as I can tell, remained friends with Lewis uh, for the rest of his life. This gun was presented to the US Navy for trials in early 1919. Uh, they did a bunch of shooting. It wasn't a complete failure. Um, it was moderately successful, but the final report written up in May of 1919 uh, did not express any interest in adopting it. And not surprisingly, uh, by the end of World War I, first off, there was a lot less need 
for machine guns, and there are a lot of other interesting designs out there to be followed up on that had more promise to them than the McLean gun. So um, I believe this is probably the only one of these ever made. McLean never made all that many of any of his guns, probably talking less than a dozen guns made by, dozen rifle caliber guns made by McLean altogether. So the fact that this one has survived is really cool. Um, it's unfortunate that it had to be legally destroyed, have the receiver cut, um, because it was a machine gun and it was not registered uh, as such. But we are, it is really cool to still see uh, the last example. There are a couple other uh, surviving McLean guns out there in various museum collections. There's at least one water-cooled one in a private collection. But uh, if you want some of the guns that were directly associated with the origin of the Lewis gun, arguably one of, arguably the best light machine gun of the First World War, this is a literally unique, one-of-a-kind example. So uh, hopefully at some point, someone will find the magazine. Uh, as I said, if you, if you have the magazine for this, uh, that big donut looking thing, if you've got a weird donut looking magazine and you don't know what it goes to, this one's floating around out there somewhere. So if you think you have it, uh, contact the Morphe Auction Company and uh, they will be happy to put you in contact with whoever ends up purchasing this gun, it would be great to reunite that magazine with the gun that it originally went to. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching.